All right. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to the NSP grant closeout process webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, before we get into the presentation, I want to um, first introduce Hunter Kurtz from the uh, Department of HUD. Um, and before I hand it completely over to him um, for today, I want to go ahead and go over the um, question asking process for today. Um, first off, my name is Lee Turner. I'm with ICF International. I'll be helping with uh, managing questions today and also with um, any technical issues you may be having. Um, so first off, um, the preferred met method for uh, submitting questions today would be using the questions box that you'll see on the GoToWebinar panel that you have. Um, you're welcome to submit any written questions there throughout the webinar and then we'll address them during our Q&A sessions. Um, if you are listening in via telephone, you're also welcome to ask your question orally. Um, what we ask you to do is use the raise your hand uh, function on your GoToWebinar panel. And once we get to that Q&A session, we will um, call out your name and then we will unmute your line for you to um, ask your question orally. If you're listening in via mic and speakers today, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and leave you muted for today just because the feedback can get um, pretty difficult to hear sometimes. So if you're listening in via mic and speakers, go ahead and just submit your question through the question panel. Um, and so to repeat again, just if you're listening via telephone, you're welcome to use both of those options, either orally or written through the questions panel. So Hunter, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. It's all yours. Thank you, Lee, um, and thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning for those of you out on the West Coast, and uh, thanks for joining us for um, today's uh, webinar. Uh, we're going to be covering uh, the NSP grant closeout process. Um, we're going to go through actually quite a bit today. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, these slides that we're looking at um, I sort of view more as a tool for you to use in the uh, future to reference. Um, so there's a lot of material here, and a lot of it we're going to go through quickly or just sort of skip if it doesn't apply to, uh, to the grantees. Some of the information only applies to the field offices. But uh, I think it's helpful for you all to know what we need to do here at HUD to close you out, as well as, um, uh, you know, sort of the process that we go through. So um, don't fear when you see some of the uh, slides we got through. We're not going to cover it all. Um, but uh, we're going to start off and just sort of talk about the resources we have. Um, well, we, three resources we encourage everyone to take a look at. The first is obviously the uh, closeout notice itself, um, and uh, then there is the uh, uh, CPD notice, and that is the directions um, that we give from headquarters to the field about how to close out a uh, NSP grant, um, and their forms and other documentation um, related to how to close a grant can be found there. Um, I want to point out that uh, not only are the uh, NSP grants um, instructions on how to close up, as well as CDBG, um, uh, CDBG State, and Disaster Recovery, uh, and CDBGR is all found in the CD CPD notice. Um, and then we put together a closeout guide, which sort of uh, tries to take that legalese in the CPD notice and uh, uh, make it uh, uh, a little more understandable. So I would uh, definitely check that out as well. Quick, uh, fast facts about closeout. Um, the criteria for closeout is not the same as uh, for meeting expenditure deadlines. I know uh, we've all come across and, and met our, 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 you know, the expenditure de deadlines have come and gone. Um, but I want to emphasize, because we continuously get this question, uh, you know, yes, just because your expenditure deadline has happened does not mean that you are uh, ready to close out. You may be, but uh, there's still typically a, uh, a fair amount of work that needs to be done. Um, there's no deadline established for closeout at this point, and uh, grantees will continue to use program income after closeout. Um, for most grantees, life after closeout is going to be the same as it was beforehand, but the big difference that I know all of you are excited about is that uh, you will no longer need to submit the uh, QPR or quarterly performance report. You only need to submit it annually. Um, there is TA available for the closeout uh, preparation, and we will go over that process. And uh, uh, all grantees are going to have a readiness check prior to, to uh, commencing the closeout process. Right now, we have 634 grants, uh, 634 NSD grants that need to be closed. Um, and I want to make sure this is really clear, because this is another uh, question we get a lot. Um, if you have received an NSP 1, 2, and 3, or NSP 1 and 3, 
um, or basically multiple NSP grants, you have to close each grant separately. You cannot go through the closeout process for NSP 1, 2, and 3 in one um, set of documents. Everything has to be done separately, unfortunately. Um, program income, and we, you know, for most grantees, program income is going to stay the same um, as it currently is, uh, and you, you know, the same requirements and all of that fun stuff. Um, but the, for the few NSP2 nonprofits and the handful of NSP3 non-entitlements without an open state CDBG grant at the time of closeout, um, the rules are a little different. Basically, uh, any program income received prior to closeout is same way it works today. Uh, any program income received during the first five years after closeout, that PI um, will uh, basically just be to be used to meet um, an eligible uh, national objective, an eligible NAT NSP national objective. And then any PI received um, five plus years after the date of closeout is considered miscellaneous revenue. But for the vast majority of the grantees, um, program income is going to stay the same as it is uh, today. The one difference will be that if um, you do earn uh, less than $25,000, um, it, it's not going to be considered program income. And that's $25,000 in a year. Uh, it could be used for admin or CDBG activities. If you earn $25,000 um, to $250,000, um, this will be considered as program income, but you will not have to meet the 25% set aside. The 25% set aside to house individuals at 50% area median income or below um, for that amount. But anything over 250,000, uh, then that 25% set aside will apply. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that these limits are: um, if you earn 25,000 and one cent, then you now have program income. If you earn $250,000 and one cent, you now need to meet the 25% set aside. The reason we put this in um, place was because uh, it, we just didn't know if it was uh, feasible to build a unit um, uh, for the 25% set aside if you had less than $250,000. Um, to close out your grant, uh, every activity funded with even a penny of line of credit funds um, needs to be complete and have met a national objective. And complete means um, basically you, it's not that you've gone out, acquired a home, rehabbed it, and you're complete. It means you've gone out, a home, uh, out acquired a home, rehabbed it, and then placed a family inside of that home, um, either through rental or sale, however you decide to do it. At that point, that activity uh, for that home would be considered complete. Uh, you need to have satisfied the uh, LH25 requirement. Again, that's the uh, requirement to house individuals at 25% AMI or less. Um, all costs need to have been incurred. For NSP2, um, you must work in all the uh, targeted census tracts that you said you were going to work in. Uh, and if you've not, um, then you need to come and uh, amend your application. So I would contact your field office immediately. Um, and any other regulatory requirements need to have been met. Um, one thing, as I think many of you know, uh, we've given you a little uh, more flexibility with the 25% set-aside requirement. Um, basically, what we've done is said that uh, you need to meet a, the, the set-aside requirement for an amount equal to 25% of your initial grant allocation. Um, and then you have three additional years to meet the 25% set-aside for any program income that you earned after receiving your grant. Um, and uh, you know the, these amounts can be made up of line of credit funds or program income. We, we don't we don't care um, which type it is. Um, but this is basically a response to the fact that you know, as many of you know, when we started the program, we we weren't sure that the NSP one program income counted towards 25% set aside. And then, fortunately, our lawyers set us straight. <laughs> that was a that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> um, so basically what I mean is that if you have a grant of $2 million and you received a, a $100,000 in program income by the date of closeout, um, your 25% set aside requirement would be $500,000. Um, and then your requirement for program income would be $25,000. So you would have a total uh, LH25 requirement of $525,000. So. Um, but you've expended at the day of closeout uh, $510,000. So you've met the requirement for the grant, uh, but you haven't quite gotten there yet for the program income. 
So you would have within uh, three years of the data closeout um, to spend an additional $15,000 towards the LH25 requirement. Um, and we've actually put together in the uh, closeout agreement a really fancy little worksheet that will come through in a few minutes uh, that helps you figure out all this, uh, this uh, math. Um, one thing I want to point out is that the, uh, this extension does not change the requirements for a program income earned post-closeout. And as I like to look at it, it's like uh, when you're sick in school, um, you know, you uh, can get an extension on your homework, but that doesn't mean that um, you don't get to do uh, any of the new homework assigned. You still have to do that. You just are getting an extension. Um, you know, again, all future program income remains subject to the LH25 requirement. Uh, and you can use future PI earnings uh, or past PI earnings to meet this requirement. So sort of like we were showing before in that example, um, they, you know, if they don't have any money on hand and they, let's just go back here real quickly. If they don't have any money on hand and they still need to admit this 15000 then they can, you know, as they earn program income, they can uh, use that program income to meet that $15,000 requirement. Quickly uh, talk about DRGR. Um, we've created a folder in MicroStrategies with a number of important reports in it. Uh, there's the final performance report, which if you haven't taken a look at, I highly recommend you do. What it does is it uh, uh, brings all the information together from your various quarterly performance reports and places them in one uh, one report. So any activities that you may have closed out, uh, you know, they drop off your QPR after uh, one or two quarters. They will show up in this final performance report. So it's also a lot of grantees I know have been using it for, uh, you know, showing other folks what they've done with this program. So it's a very handy tool, and I'll show you how to get there in a second where this uh, uh, this folder is. Um, support data for addresses. That report can be a substitute for attachment E, which we'll get to in a little bit. There's also a uh, report, a new report in there called FIN Report 07 um, B. Uh, this uh, shows you if there's any, um, if the project is complete in DRGR and if there's any line of credit funds used towards that project. Uh, and then there is a report, um, which we keep having some problems with, but it should be working now, uh, demonstrating um, where you stand on your uh, LH25 requirement. So to find these reports, uh, here's the path. Uh, I want to point out that we have the field office users on the left and the grantee, just the name of the, um, that report, and then this closeout reports, and you'll find all the reports I was just referring to in that folder in your um, report section of the RGR. They pull the final performance, the final performance report. You will uh, um, open it up and you'll get this, uh, this screen in MicroStrategies. Um, what you'll do is then open uh, the correct grant, NSP 1, 2, or 3. Um, You'll find the grant number, um, which quite honestly for all of you, it should just show you that one grant number, but if you're a field office, you may have, uh, have more. Um, but all of you are going to need to uh, export it to the, uh, uh, this little uh, selected area, so you need to click on it and then hit the export button, or hit the over button, and then hit the export button, and you'll get the uh, final performance report. So. Let's, uh, let's take a break here real quickly before we start the process and just see if there are any, um, any questions out there. Sure, we have a couple. Um, I will okay. just start running down. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five. We have five. Um, so the first one is, uh, in the NSP policy alert of 1125, 2014, guidance on land bank disposition, if we met a national objective when we acquired properties, then we can sell them to people over 120% AMI, and if we have expended less than 25000 we can take it out of the program without having to reimburse HUD. Is that correct? Um, i got to be honest. I'm not a, uh, a, a, the greatest land bank expert out there. I think you are correct, but we are going to be announcing a webinar on um, land banks that is going to be coming up in the next, uh, next couple weeks. Um, so you might want to hold your question there, or I'd really encourage you to actually submit it into our Ask a Question uh, website, uh, and then we can make sure we get you the correct answer. But I, I believe you are correct, but I, I would not take that to the bank. Okay, uh, next question. Will we receive a copy of the presentation materials? Um, so I can answer this one. Um, yes, there will be presentation materials that are posted on the um, event page after this, um, the same email account that 
um, gave you the announcement for this, we will use that to announce the uh, availability of the materials. Um, so just take, keep a lookout for that in the next week or two. Um, next question, if you have a small amount of LSC funds remaining, when will HUD sweep these funds during the closeout process? Some grantees were looking to use these LSC funds as admin for closeout. Um, the, the line of credit funds uh, will be swept at um, at the time of uh, immediately after um, you have uh, signed the closeout agreement. But the thing is, when you sign the closeout agreement, you state how much fund how much how much is left in your line of credit, and then those funds are lost. Well, I do want to point out that there is a um, there's another issue for NSP two grantees, which um, I think we would have some more information coming out, and we've talked about it in the past, is that their lines of credits are going to be swept at the end of uh, uh, this fiscal year. So October 1st uh, uh, of this year, um, all of their funds will be swept in that are left in their line of credit. But that only applies to NSP2 grantees, and uh, um, hopefully we'll have some, some more news about that in, in the future and, and uh, maybe some, some steps that might be able to uh, to make that a little easier for you to get down to that line of credit funds. Um, but uh, if you're planning on using it for admin for closeout, that's fine. But I mean, you just you there's going to come a point where you need to submit a number to us that's left so that we can sweep it, and uh, so you're going to need to have drawn those funds um, before that point. All right. Next question. Um, you've got a hundred thousand as an example for PI. But I thought the 25% LH requirement only impacted if you earned 25 in a cent in one year. That is true after you close out the grant. Uh, today, any if you earn any amount, then you do need to meet the 25% set aside uh, on that amount in a year. Okay, um, and then the next question, do the program income limits relate to a calendar year or, or a lifetime? The program income limits will relate to a calendar year. And what we're going to do, and work with your, you're going to need to work with your field office for this, is that we'll basically, you're going to close out your grant, and then we'll probably uh, create an artificial year for your first year so that you can uh, have your reporting due with all the other reporting uh, that you need to do for your CDBG grants and other type of uh, um, reports due to HUD so that you don't have this sort of random report that's due on a random day just to make your lives easier. So the first year may be an abbreviated year, if you will, um, and then you can start submitting your annual performance report as well as your, um, you know, track your program income based off of that, uh, um, that, uh, that new date. All right, uh, next question. What if all of the units are not sold? How can we perform closeout? Well, there are two questions you need to ask yourself. The first is, are there any line of credit funds in those, um, uh, in those units? And again, line of credit funds are the funds you draw from HUD from your initial grant allocation. Um, and if there are no line of credit funds in that unit, then you can proceed to close out the grant. Uh, you'll still need to meet the national objective, but there's not, it, it won't stop you from um, closing out the grant. If there are a line of credit funds and you can't sell the unit, then you're going to need to, I'd recommend either talking to your field office, get some advice, or look at possibly uh, uh, getting some technical assistance from our web TA um, on the HUD Exchange portal. Uh, because we probably need to get you some help to get rid of those units. But you cannot close out a, uh, your grant until you have met a uh, national objective for each one of those, uh, those units with any line of credit funds in there. All right, and then who will be the authorized signator to sign the closeout uh, certification? The director, mayor, city manager? Uh, I, I think it's my understanding that it's who's ever signed you know, the grant agreement. OK, and will the 1% discount continue to be required on property acquisition with PI funds even though the market has changed? Yes, but yes, yes, it will. Um, my only thought is I'm curious if that will still apply to NSP2 nonprofits and NSP3 non-entitlements post-closeout. 
um, for that first five years. And that I don't know. And uh, huh. let me see if I can if I can get somebody to to, to find that answer out um, for us. But uh, for all other grantees, yes, the one percent discount will continue to apply. Okay, and uh, last question for this round. Uh, do grantees need to change all LOC funded activities to complete in DRGR, or is it okay to leave activities as underway and just have all LOC funded activities having met a national objective? You will need to demonstrate that in DRGR that each one of the activities is uh, complete. So we're encouraging grantees to, um, you know, as they continue to create new activities, basically the exact same activity except that it is it, responsible, you know, it, deals with program income so that you can continue to fund it after you've marked it complete. Okay, that's all I have for this round, so I think we can go ahead. And I, I think it's worthwhile pointing out, we're going to have a number of webinars coming up here in the near future. Uh, I know we've had a, a, a break for a while. Um, and uh, we're going to, one of those will be a uh, uh, preparing a DRGR for closeout. So, um, folks more, uh, more knowledgeable about DRGR can, can walk you through how to do some of those, uh, you know, marking activities as complete and creating new activities for program income. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so let's start talking about the process to close out a grant. As I said, there are 26 steps to close down a grant. Um, we are going to uh, review them, but very quickly and quite honestly, a number of them at, towards the end we're just going to skip because they only um, are uh, necessary for HUD and uh, um, headquarters in the field office. So the first step is um, somebody assigns uh, uh, or encourages a grantee to check out uh, the NSP guidance on one CPD, or I guess it's now the HUD exchange. We have a nice little um, on the resource exchange, a uh, information about some questions that you need to ask yourself about whether or not you're ready to close out or not. Um, and uh, if you are, then you click the yes button, and it will encourage you to sign up for some TA to uh, get a uh, uh, closeout check. Um, while that's going on, for folks who think they're ready to close, we've also been uh, aggressively uh, looking at our uh, our reports from DRGR to see who has uh, uh, expended. Um, all their line of credit funds and uh, going, uh, just getting the TA providers starting on those TA uh, closeout checks even before the, um, uh, you know, they may, the grantees may have requested them just in an, an attempt to get as many of you closed as possible. Um, but after you get assigned your or request your closeout check, what we call phase one begins. And uh, we request, review the requests and assign um, the closeout check TA which is going to be a maximum of 16 hours per grantee. The TA providers are going to contact the field office and inform them that they are uh, starting this readiness check on uh, with this one, you know, the specific grantee. Um, and then the TA provider will contact the grantee and basically review the draft version of the final performance report uh, and other DRGR reports, including, um, you know, the, the, where their line of credit stands, see what uh, you know, the eligibility to uh, of all their activities, as well as uh, spot sec check some uh, beneficiary data. Um, and just see if there's anything else that needs to be talked about. Um, they're going to uh, sort of just talk to you about everything that we have on this closeout recommendation report, walk you through that. Um, they're also going to uh, evaluate your uh, status versus the uh, closeout checklist, one of the forms found in the CPD notice. Um, and then they're going to uh, just walk through the uh, closeout package or the close CPD notice as well as other forms that are found in that notice to try to help you prepare to close out and fill those out. Um, they're going to complete the uh, recommendation form and submit it to HUD, uh, both the field office as well as uh, headquarters. Um, and at that point, step two begins. Um, even though this report may say that they think you're ready to close out, the determination to begin the closeout process is a joint uh, uh, determination between grantees and the field office. So once they think you all are ready, <coughs> excuse me, once you both feel that you are ready, um, then they'll start the process. So they're going to submit the closeout package to the grantee, uh, and then they're going to 
to, you know, I love this step. They're going to complete the package, submit it to the field office, because that one, you know, what is that, six words, seven words, um, make it uh, seem so easy to fill out all those forms to get it back. Um, but the field office will then review the closeout package, and we'll go over the forms here in just a second. Um, the field office is going to review the, review the closeout package, and then in the package, the grantee will have filled out the closeout certification, uh, half of it, uh, as it stood um, of the day they submitted the forms. Um, and the field office just needs to ensure that those numbers on the certification, the numbers about the amount of line of credit funds left and uh, program income earned and program income expended and all that fun stuff are still accurate. Um, and if they are, uh, if they're not, they'll just fix that and then um, sign it and submit it back to the grantee. At that point, the field office is basically telling the grantee that they've accepted their forms and the grantee needs to submit a, um, the final QPR. Um, they have 90 days from the day the uh, certification is signed to submit the final QPR, and there are three ways to do it. I like to call them the before, the one, and the two method. The before method is basically if you, um, if you are a grantee that has completed all of their national objectives a while ago, uh, and have just sort of been waiting for this closeout process to begin, and have been submitting the same QPR saying, you know, you're not earning any program income, um, and you're just basically saying we've met all our national objectives, nothing's changed from last quarter. Um, then as long as the HUD feels that that QPR is complete and accurate, uh, at the point that they receive the, um, uh, the closeout certification, the field office has the ability, if, if the grantee says that this is what they want to do using this before method, um, the field office can then say that's fine, you have uh, we accept your previous QPR and as your final QPR, and uh, you're, you're good to go. And just want to point out one thing. We talk about final QPRs. There's really no difference between a final and uh, a, any, any other QPR, except for the fact that you just need to ensure that all the numbers add up, that their narratives are complete and accurate, um, and that the information there is basically your last chance to talk about um, what you did with your with your grant. Um, you'll have the annual performance reports to talk about what you've done with your program, your know, future program income, but uh, it needs to be as complete and accurate as possible uh, for this for this final QPR. The two QPR method is if um, you are, you know, you, you're in that. Uh, for instance, right now we're in the 30-day submittal period for NC1 and three grantees for the QPR. So you get the closeout certification today. And you're like, you know, I still got a lot of work, got some, some cleaning up I need to do, but I think this is good enough to submit for just your regular QPR, quote unquote. Uh, you could submit that, and then you would have the remainder of that 90 days from the day you received the certification to clean up the QPR and submit the final QPR. Um, and then the one QPR method is quite simply that you've re you know, you received this closeout certification, um, and uh, then you submit your just one QPR that represents both your final QPR as well as your uh, quote unquote regular QPR. Um, so then the field office will uh, review and approve this final QPR um, and prepare the closeout agreement. The uh, field office and the grantee execute the closeout agreement um, and the basically the, when the day that the CPD director or the field office director, whoever's signing the closeout agreement for the field office, um, the day they sign that is the day that the grant is officially closed. And that is the day the Robert, you know, it, hallelujah, we closed the grant, basically, on uh, that day. So the grant is closed, and at that point, you're pretty much done with the closeout process. We here at headquarters, as well as the field office, still have a number of steps that we need to do. Um, and I'm not going to go over those today, um, but uh, I just want to let you know that those are um, that there are more steps here. Feel free to take a look at them when you see the uh, the slides. Um, do we have any questions at this point, or should we start talking about the forms? And we'll have a chance to ask more questions at the end. Yeah, we'll go through a couple questions for now at least. Um, first one: What if our last activities are funded with a combination of NSP two and NSP three money? If the acquired home is substantially renovated by 9-30-15, yet not formally sold, can we still close out NSP2 
we would then draw the final amount and or receipt revenue in NSP 3, 10, 1, 15, and after. So I think, let me just make sure I understand this. They're saying that they, they've drawn their line of credit funds for NSP 2, and they're still working on the property, and then continue to draw funds for NSP 3 to finish the property. When can they close out? Um, the answer would be they can close out when that property is sold and has an individual living in it. it the, the fact that they're clearing the, uh, the line of NSP2 line of credit funds are being cleared does not mean that the grantees have to close out the grants at that point. Um, they're still going to need to wait until they've met a national objective for every, uh, um, every uh, penny of line of credit funds spent. Okay, uh, and do you get 16 hours of TA total for closeout or 16 hours of TA for each NSP round for closeout? Uh, the TA is basically to do the uh, closeout uh, check. Um, they can ask or help you with uh, some minor stuff, but uh, one of the things we get out of the uh, closeout uh, check is um, a recommendations for additional TA. And uh, we've been... Uh, uh, you know, signing folks up and getting folks that type of assistance if they need it. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of it is uh, DRGR related, and uh, we're trying to get as much out there as we can. Okay. Uh, next, what is the best way to spend line of credit funds first versus program income? Ah, uh, the great question. Well. The first thing is, you know, we have the first in, first out rules. So you need to spend program income before you spend line of credit funds. So there are a couple ways to go about getting to the, uh, the line of credit funds. Probably the, the, the most obvious is just accelerate your, your spending. Um, the, the next is setting up some sort of uh, revolving loan fund. And what that would do is, um, and, and believe me, revolving loan funds are RLS, are, are a lot more complex than I'm about to explain. But in general, what you do is you say that uh, my um, acquisition rehab um, program, I'm going to set an RLF before, and any um, program income that I earn uh, from the, you know, the sale of the homes that I acquired and rehabbed uh, would go into my RLF. Um, and then any time I do it, did a new acquisition rehab um, activity, I would draw my funds from my RLF. Uh, rather than my um, program income, my right, standard program income or line of credit accounts. So what this does is if you're earning a lot of program income, it gets it sort of out of your way, but it doesn't allow you to draw from the other accounts for that activity. You have to draw from your RLF first. Um, there is a lot of guidance out there on the Hub Exchange uh, about RLFs. Um, we've done some webinars that you can look at. Um, so if you're interested in that, take a look at those. Uh, think about contacting your field office to talk about it, as well as um, looking at, <coughs> excuse me, um, thinking about getting some, some uh, technical assistance. But, uh, you know, it, it's not, we, we don't, unfortunately, don't have a magic bullet to, uh, to deal with these, uh, uh, the question of how you draw down your program income before you get to your line of credit funds. Okay, uh, next question. In order to help spend NSP3 DRGR PI funds, may we use PI funds for NSP3 state purchased properties? So I guess the grantee is not the state, and they want to acquire and or they want to rehab properties that the state has, uh, has purchased with their funds. That is uh, completely acceptable. Um, I would encourage you to be very cautious in doing that and ensure that you... Uh, are documenting your activities accurately, and um, this is a this is something the IG enjoys to look at, and um, it can get a little sticky when you have two different grantees working on the same project. So just just make sure um, whatever you're doing is is well documented. But absolutely, you can uh, you can spend your funds on a uh, uh, property that the state has uh, has acquired or vice versa. All right, uh, next question. So with the final QPR, when that's submitted, um, are any remaining LSE funds swept after that? Yes. Um, it's actually the, uh, the LSE funds will be swept at um, the point that the uh, grant agreement is signed. Um, and it, 
you know, we, we have to let our, um, our folks know uh, in our accounting office, and then they, um, they sweep the amount. Um, but you're going to need to know what, how much you're going to leave in your line of credit before that point um, because uh, you're going to have to, in, in the forms, we're asking for that information. Um, and I want to point out that if you, know, if you spend any of the funds other than admin, you're going to have to meet a national objective. So. Okay, just a couple more here. Um, if national objective is met and all uh, LOC funds are spent, can the grantee close out even if they have program income left? Or does close out only take place when all funds are spent? No, 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 no. We, we assume that you will have program income left um, and that uh, you know, a lot of grantees definitely do. Um, so you're more than welcome to close out as long as all activities that have a, um, a even a penny of line of credit funds have met a national objective. So if you have a house and it has ten dollars of line of credit funds in it and the rest is program income, that house needs to meet a national objective before you can close out. Um, if you have program income on hand, we expect that will happen. Um, that's fine and that's great. I mean that allows the program to continue. One thing I do want to point out, though, that the rules revolving around program income and uh, how they, you know, whether or not it's, you know, the various uh, regulations and everything apply to when you earn the program income, not when you expend the program income. So if you ha want to look, you know, if you have $10,000 on hand at the day you close out, um, you can't say, oh, it's less than 25000 so it's, uh, it's admin funds. It's, uh, that $10,000 will have all the rules that apply to it as of today because you're not closed. Okay, uh, last question for this round. Does the 25K maximum PI limit apply to each grantee subgrantee PI or to the aggregation of all of the grantee subgrantee PI? It's aggregation of all grantees. And I should also note that the 25K rule applies to states as well. I know that's not the case for... Uh, um, the CDBG program, but uh, when we created the NSP program, we used the entitlement rules for program income, so we're stuck with the four states, the 25K rule. So, okay. it, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that's, that's it for the questions for this round. All right. Let's uh, take a look at uh, our forms. Uh, one thing I encourage you to take a look at are these links here uh, that go to the HUD exchange. Um, these provide uh, some the forms that you can download, uh, as well as um, some instructional videos to how to complete the, uh, uh, the various forms, uh, except for the checklist. There we have an annotated checklist that sort of walks you through what we're looking for, um, just a little description for, for most of the questions. But uh, if you have any questions, I would you know, definitely check those out. Um, one thing you should point out is that uh, no um, form may be changed without prior approval from headquarters. Um, there are some instances in the forms um, where there are you, you have to choose one or the other type of language, and that's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to if you want or the field office has a desire to change anything else. Um, we need to come back to headquarters, and we need to go back to our general counsel's office to get any type of approval. I don't know quite what the situation would be that we would need to do this, but I, I just want to make it clear that, you know, you can't just, uh, you nor the field office can change the forms without, without us getting approval from our attorneys. Um, the cover letter, and you can see here the, the red text that I was referring to uh, before, uh, and the red text typically signifies something that needs to either be uh, inserted or changed depending on the grant. Um, this would be the cover letter that the field office will submit to the grantee with the other forms. Um, the checklist, uh, you know, pretty self-explanatory. There's yes, no, um, it, and it will always tell you if no or if yes, explain, and then there will be explanation boxes where you can put in a reason why. Feel free to, uh, to add other pages if you need to explain why you have to answer a question the way that we're not looking for. This um, attachment E is the management plan for continued affordability. This form is basically a list of every property uh, that you have, as well as the DRGR activity number and the start and end date of the affordability periods. And in the past, we talked about the fact that there is a, um, a 
form found in the DRGR folder um, that actually has all this information and a little bit more. Um, I would highly encourage you to go into DRGR and download that report and submit it rather than filling out this form. Uh, it's a lot easier, and all you need to do is just you know print out the Excel sh spreadsheet and, and uh, send it or email it to your uh, your field office. Um, if you want to, you could fill out this form, but I, I would really, really encourage you just to use that report because you can't close out the grant until you tell us the start and end date of every affordability, every property in DRGR. So um, it just seems to me that you know there's no reason to duplicate your uh, your effort there. Um, and just exactly what's going over it, it, the support data for addresses is the report. Uh, one of the things you do need to submit is the uh, is a land bank plan. Any properties that you have land bank currently, you need to at the date of close up um, demonstrate how you're going to um, dispose of those properties within ten years. Um, we don't have a definitive example, um, but we just need a, a general plan about how you you are going to go about in doing this. This doesn't mean that you need to be so specific that you're saying. At 123 Main Street, we plan to um, build a house in five years uh, for LH25 uh, folks. You just need to say that you know we are looking at the properties in Main Street as well as Oak Street, and considering you know X, Y, and Z um, as we get uh, more CDBG funds or you know, whatever you uh, whatever you plan to do. Um, it you know it doesn't need to be specific by address, but uh, it does need to be. Uh, pretty solid plan about how you're going to get there, um, how you're going to dispose of these properties in 10 years. Um, for attachment B is the certification. Um, this certification is what we were talking about. This is what your um, the grantee will sign and fill out the amount of the grant, uh, the amount dispersed, um, all that fun stuff. Um, that uh, there you'll see there it says number three on that uh, form is grant funds recaptured. I know we're getting a lot of questions about when we're going to sweep line of credit funds. This is at the point where uh, you need to identify how much you have left in your line of credit. Um, so this uh, this is also what you'll get back from the uh, field office um, at uh, letting you know that you can begin the QPR process. Um, attachment D is the closeout agreement. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, sort of either or paragraphs that the field office will add to this, uh, and then sort of send you um, send you the, uh, the the agreement. Uh, but one thing I want to point out is that oh, um, we have a worksheet uh, at the back of the uh, the closeout agreement that walks you through um, and walks the field office through how uh, how much is left in programming or how much is left towards meeting the 25 percent set aside that needs to be done um, and uh, we have this sort of explanation here that comes from um, the closeout uh, guide that we did but I want to sort of walk us through it real quickly and just sort of think back from that grantee in slide 12 that had the, uh, the two million dollar grant with a hundred thousand dollars program income they so they have a uh, LH25 requirement of five hundred and twenty five thousand um, and uh, They've only expended 510,000 at the date of closeout. So what you'll do is, uh, uh, you know, in box 1A, you'll put the 2 million. In box uh, 1B, obviously 25% of 2 million is 500,000. Um, the date of amount 2A is going to be the amount of program income at the date of uh, the closeout. Um, 2B is uh, the date that the um, uh, you know, the 25% of the 100,000, so it's 25,000. Um, obviously, A3 is a, uh, A1 and A2 added together, and same for B3. Um, B4 is where you're going to put the amount that you expended towards 25% set aside. Um, and this number obviously needs to be more than B1 before you can close out. Uh, and then in B5, you basically just subtract the 525 from the 510, and you get the 15,000 that you uh, that you still need to expend before you close out the grant. 
um, and that will that's the number that will go into the closeout agreement and state that you have three years from the date of the closeout agreement to um, uh, to meet that requirement. So that is uh, that's the those are the forms. Are there are there any other questions we want to uh, take people through or people may have? Sure, we have a couple. Um, let's see. So the first one, um, so if you've met your national objective and met the set-aside um, and have expensed all program income but still have um, over 25 k in NSP1 and over 25 k in NSP3, do they need to request an extension to use those funds or do they request to have those funds swept from the LOC to, to proceed with final closeout? If you have, if we um, expect that most grantees are going to have an amount left in their um, their line of credit. It doesn't apply to the, the the 25 more or less doesn't apply here. You know, a lot of grantees are, are going to end up walking away from you know a couple hundred bucks, a couple thousand dollars that they're just not going to be able to get to, uh, and that is laid out in the forms. Um, you know, take a look at the forms and you'll see where it says the amount that's uh, that's left in the line of credit. And uh, that will be swept at the time of closeout. Um, if you have program income on hand, we're not taking your program income. That that will remain with you, and you can continue to use it after uh, after closeout. And you'll you know you'll need to use it. Okay. Next question: um, Is the form filled out on addresses? Is that one filled out for each unit or each structure? Uh, yeah, it's each structure. So if you have a uh, multifamily property. We just need to know the affordability period for, you know, one, two, three Main Street, not one, two, three Unit A, one, two, three Unit B. And that is, uh, you'll see that in DRGR when you fill it out. That's why I, I would encourage you to um, to pull that report rather than filling out the uh, the uh, the attachment because it will uh, it will do all that for you. All right, um, and can you close out individual subgrantees as they complete their grants? Uh, no, you can, in the sense that you no longer are going to deal with them. But uh, we will only close out you as the grantee. You are will be the one that needs to submit the forms, and um, uh, at that point, you will be closed. We're not going to accept um, close out packets from each one of your subs. So I think that's a valid, a very important point to make. That we will take one packet from each grantee for each grant, not a number of packets because of the subs. Okay. Uh, next question: uh, Can a state allow its grantees to keep their program income in a revolving loan fund? I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Sure. Can a state allow its grantees to keep their program income in a revolving loan fund? Can a state allow its grantees to keep its program income? So the state allow its subs to keep their program income in a revolving loan fund? Yes. But again, if you're going to set up a revolving loan fund, I really encourage you to go get some uh, TA. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are all sorts of, uh, we've done entire webinars on that. Um, it, it's a very complex issue. But in general, yes, subgrantees can, um, uh, you know, you can create RLFs, but it, it has to be by activity. Okay. Um, so next question is, what report or form did you suggest instead of attachment E? And a clarifying question of um, who fills out these forms. Is the grantee correct? Yes, it is the grantee, and we encourage you to submit the support data for addresses. It's one of the forms found in the... Uh, uh, the closeout folder in DRGR. Let me see if I can go back and find the path. Here we go. So it's this NSP closeout reports. Support data for addresses is a um, report in there, and uh, you can just print that out or download that. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of information in it, so you might want to just take a second and cut out some of the uh, information that's not needed. But it will have all the information that you need for attachment E, which is basically the address, the DRGR activity number, the um, uh, beginning of the affordability period, the end of the affordability period, and the method used to ensure affordability, whether it be recapture, resale, or some other method. 
All right, and what is the reporting requirement for PI after closeout? PI will need to be reported um, in an annual performance report, um, which we were talking about earlier, which will be tied to however you in the field office want to start your, your yearly, yearly reports. Um, it will uh, just need to be reported basically annually. I would encourage you to report or to continue to fill out DRGR and use that to uh, report on your PI as you go throughout the year so you don't end up uh, trying to figure out what you did over the last year, um, a couple days before your reports do. All right, next question. Um, could you define applicable credit and how is it treated? Uh, that's another great question. Um, go back and see if I can find the uh, page here. Oh, and, oh applicable credit. Um, I think they're referring to all costs incurred. I'm not, I guess I, I need to ask what, in what sense they're asking for applicable credit. Um, Yeah, I mean, could you could whoever wrote that question, if they could call in, that'd be great. We, I, I just I need to I want a bit of a clarification before I try to answer that because it could be a couple things. Okay, I think that person is actually over uh, mic and speakers. We can give it a shot. Um, if Bryant asks you is there, we'll go ahead and unmute your line. Let's see if it works. Of course. Bryant, are you ready? Uh, yeah, can you, can you hear us? Yep, we yep. can hear you. How are you doing, sir? Hi, how are you? Wonderful. So basically what we're dealing with is cost savings on a project where we go out and say it's possibly two million. At the end of the project, realize the cost didn't come to two million over cost savings, so they give us back, say, two hundred thousand. Okay. So you, okay, I just I just want to ensure that that's what I thought you were talking about. Yes. So you have a you returned an applicable credit of two hundred thousand. So basically that is not program income, that is then, um, uh, you can return that um, basically to your line of credit or you can, if it's program income, just hang on to it or probably the easiest way to do it is um, so basically apply that to your next draw from DRGR. But you need to do that um, within a couple days of receiving the applicable credit. Okay. So I, I would try to arrange you receiving that money and um, uh, spending that money to be as quickly as possible so that you don't need to return it to your line of credit, which is a bit of a hassle. Great. Thanks. But the, the, you don't get that 10% admin from the program income or 25% you, you, or, uh, set aside applied to that. It's just basically you receiving the funds back. Right. right. So there, it, it's not, we don't look at it as, uh, you know, there, there are no additional rules or applications anything that applies to it. Great. Thanks for the clarification. No problem. Thank you for your for clarification as well. All right, next question. How would it be possible to close with the remaining PI when PI is always expended before entitlement draws, or is it only PI earned during the process of closeout? How would you... You could still have, there. I guess the question is, how do you close if you have PI and you still have funds in your line of credit? And the answer is, um, there are a lot of folks who have already drawn down all their line of credit and are just waiting for the properties to meet a national objective but are still earning program income. Or um, you have such a little amount left in your line of credit that you don't, um, you, you're just going to let it go. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I know when we look at our DRGR reports, there are a handful of grantees with, you know, under $100 left in a line of credit, and I assume that they're probably never going to get to that those funds. Um, but there's no requirement that if you have PI that you can't close. Like, you, you're more than welcome to close, as long as you've met a national objective for all of your line of credit funds. I think that's what their question was. If not, please write back in or call, or we can... Okay, um, next question. Oh, we're still getting some questions about who fills out the attachments. Just want to oh. clarify that it is the grantee who's filling out these attachments. Yes, yeah. All um, 
forms need to be uh, filled out by the grantee and submitted to the field office, not the subrecipients. Right. Um, okay, so next question then. Is there a plan to audit any certain percentage of NSP grantees after all closeouts have been completed? Um, that is something that we and the field office will need to work out uh, using our, our, our risk analysis for, uh, um, you know, as, as the field offices do their, their yearly uh, determination who they're going to uh, monitor. Okay, and we have a follow-up to that uh, previous question. Um, they clarify that it, if you have to spend program income first, they're worried that you can't even spend all of your, of your line of credit. If that is the case and they're having problems getting down the line of credit, um, I would uh, seek some technical assistance or talk to their field offices. Uh, there, there are some strategies that we can recommend. Um, we're talking about uh, revolving loan funds as well as possibly accelerating your, um, uh, your, your expenditures. Okay, just a couple more questions. Um, one is a throwback question. When does the affordability period begin for a, a project? Affordability period begins, it depends on the project. If it's a single family home, um, it begins at the day of occupancy, which we usually call whenever you, you know, at the day of the closing, as long as the person isn't going to wait three years before they move into the house. Um, the, uh, for a um, uh, multifamily, it's typically when the project has reached either the number of units that are required to be NSP based off of, you know, pro rata depending on the funding, or when the unit, the property has reached um, stabilized occupancy. And stabilized occupancy obviously would be declared market, you know, we determine market by market. And All project right. project. So this next question is prefaced by don't laugh too hard, but is there any likelihood of any uh, NSP4 or some other version of NSP funding? Um, that is, uh, you know, we always keep hearing about People introducing Project Rebuild, which is basically uh, NSP4. Um, you, you have to ask somebody else than I whether or not that has a, a chance in Congress. I, I don't know. But, I, you know, a lot of people like to say we do sort of have an NSP4 around here because we have, um, you know, over a uh, over billion dollars in, in program income already. Uh, and, and we think um, some folks think that it's possible we might each, even reach uh, two at the end of the day. So um, that there's still a lot of money out there, um, not all of it in the line of credits, a lot of, most of it in program income that's being expended. Okay, and one last question. Having spent an amount of LOC funds plus program income that equal the original amount of LOC funds, um, does that count as having spent all LOC funds? It does not. It's not like the expenditure deadline. You actually have to expend and meet a national objective for every, um, for your line of credit funds. Um, if not, those funds will be swept. Um, so, you know, that's sort of the way uh, Treasury works. When you close out a grant, you can't have anything left in that line of credit. All right, that does it for our questions. Um, just really quickly before you wrap up, Hunter, just want to uh, clarify for everybody that um, I'm going to leave the last page up for uh, an additional 10 or 15 minutes just so everyone can see the Survey Monkey, that, which is the, um, the link for um, the feedback evaluation for this webinar um, for folks to see, and there will be additional resources sent out to folks in the future. Well, thank you all for, uh, for participating. I, you know, give everyone a second, too, in case there's any last-minute questions. But, uh, be on the lookout. We are going to do uh, a number of webinars, including uh, help for DRGR, um, for close out, um, some question and answer webinars, general uh, questions you might have, um, as well as some other, uh, uh, you know, land banks and other uh, interesting areas that we, we want to talk about. So thank you all. Anything else? Uh, oh, we do have a couple of last minute questions. All, all right. right. Um, I'll throw them out there. So um, one person says that they have a grantee that has drawn down 163% of their original budget. Uh, funds were drawn from both LSC and PI. However, the total drawdown from LSC is only 84% of the original budget. Um, 
So at this point, being clo close to NSB closeout, can we draw from LSC first before drawing from PI? At this point, the answer to that is no. You still have to draw. We, we were, you know, stuck with the OMB first in, first out rules. So you still need to draw from your um, uh, program income first, and then your line of credit. Okay, great. And then uh, one last question appears to be from a TA provider um, asking if there's going to be any webinars for TA providers related to closing out. Uh, we, I mean, no. We do uh, calls and things like that for PA, TA providers, but we're not going to provide webinars for TA providers. If they have a question, they should uh, ask their GTM. Okay, I think that does it. And again, to reiterate, there will be um, these resources posted on the event page at a later date, and the, uh, there will be an email sent out to everyone that uh, notifies them of this. So I think that does it. Hunter, I don't know if you have anything else, but I think that's I it. Thank you all, and uh, have a great day.